This is African News Tonight on The Voice of America. Hello and welcome. Welcome to VOA Africa. Thank you for joining us. I'm Yehiyas Wuhib in Washington. Here's what's coming up on African News Tonight. The protesters are also calling for peace and reconciliation in the Central African state. Organizers say the protests began in towns and villages across Cameroon on Monday. That's uh, reporter Moki Edwin Kinzaka on peace protests in Cameroon. Details coming up also. The death toll in clashes between Nigerian farmers and herders rises to 85. And leaders of the Group of Seven Nations start their annual summit tomorrow. These stories and more on African News Tonight. We start with our top story. In Cameroon, thousands of people are demonstrating this week, calling for peace and reconciliation ahead of National Day on May 20th. Peace caravans led by activists, clerics, and traditional rulers are calling for an end to hate speech and the separatist conflict that has killed more than 6,000 people in Cameroon since 2017. Mokirwin Kinzeka reports from Yaoundé, Cameroon. A band of youths leads several hundred Cameroonians in protest against hate speech in the capital Yaoundé on Thursday. The protesters are also calling for peace and reconciliation in the Central African state. Organizers say the protests began in towns and villages across Cameroon on Monday ahead of the country's National Day on May 20. Thousands of Christians from Cameroon's Catholic Presbyterian and Baptist churches joined the protest in Yaoundé Thursday. Reverend Father Humphrey Tatambui is the Director of Communications at the National Episcopal Conference of Cameroon. He says Christians cannot be indifferent at a time when increasing hate speech and xenophobic statements are creating conflicts and damaging Cameroon's image. It is wickedness and the type of hate speech that destroys a country. If we want peace in this country, we must learn to start controlling the kind of words we use, the way we talk to other people, and dialogue. Mbui said clashes between communities increased in Cameroon after the disputed 2018 presidential election in which President Paul Bia was declared the winner. Opposition leader Maurice Camto also claims victory. In addition, some French-speaking host communities accuse English speakers displaced by the separatist conflict in the West of being separatist fighters or sympathizers. The tension goes the other way too. Earlier this month, a human rights group said scores of French-speaking civilians in English-speaking regions were victims of hate speech. Meanwhile, Cameroon's National Communication Council issued over two dozen warnings last year to radio and TV stations the NCC says hosted guests who promoted hate speech. Cameroon's Communication Minister René Emmanuel Sadi says civilians are also increasingly using social media to vilify and humiliate people or to incite hatred and call for violence against people of different religions, languages, ethnic groups, and gender. Sadi says all social strata in Cameroon suffer the consequences of hate speech found by some civil society groups, intellectuals, politicians, activists, and social influencers. He says the most common manifestations of hate speech in Cameroon include ethnic and social discrimination, stigmatization, tribalism, irredentist claims, calls for insurgency and sometimes genocide, gender violence and violence against minorities. Sadi said the Cameroon government is fighting hate speech as a priority to safeguard democracy and the rule of law and to preserve the values of peace, unity and living together. The government says President Bia wants Cameroonians to show love for their country as they celebrate National Day on Saturday. Bia will preside over celebrations in Yaoundé. In 2021, the International Crisis Group warned in a report that social media platforms, especially Facebook, were increasingly being used by Cameroonian youths 
to heighten political and ethnic tensions. Moki Edwin Kinzaka for VOA News, Yaoundé, Cameroon. Local officials say the death toll in fighting between herders and farmers in central Nigeria has risen to 85 with thousands displaced. The clashes erupted Monday in Plateau State, which straddles the country's predominantly Muslim North and mostly Christian South. Ethnic and religious divisions have existed in the area for years. Officials are not sure what prompted the latest round of violence, but killings and retaliations killings between herders and farmers have spread into armed gang attacking other communities and revenge attacks. The head of the local government council, Daput Munster Daniel, told the French news agency AFP that 85 bodies were recovered. He also said several houses were destroyed and many people are now displaced. Joseph Kwangat, a community leader from a local development association, confirmed the death toll of 85. In Sudan, hospitals and health facilities have struggled to keep operating since intense fighting broke out last month in Khartoum and rapidly spread to other parts of the country. A medical and surgical team from Doctors Without Borders, known as MSF, has started treating patients at Bashir Teaching Hospital on the south side of Khartoum as ongoing violence rapidly increases medical needs in the capital and elsewhere. VOA's Douglas and Puga reached Will Harper, MSF Emergency Coordinator in Khartoum, to find out more. Doctors Without Borders is currently working in South Khartoum. We're running a surgical and ER in the Bashir Teaching Hospital in South Khartoum. We arrived uh, two weeks ago for a, a rapid assessment, and then we've been active treating cases and saving lives in this hospital uh, for the past 10 days. What type of patients are you getting? Are these uh, bullet wounds? Or what, what type of patients do you have? Uh, Doctors Without Borders, uh, our team on the ground here working with the volunteers and, and staff here in the hospital, we're seeing, to put it simply, the impact of war, full stop. Uh, we're seeing gunshot wounds, uh, victims of bomb blasts, uh, shelling, we're also seeing the, the surgical needs that exist in a city the size of Khartoum, traffic accidents and, and things impacting civilian life uh, daily. Our first day of intervention, we, we saw six zero sixty gunshot wounds come through the hospital. Uh, my team last night was in the operating theater until 5 a.m., so the needs are, are pretty enormous and, and the number of cases coming through, traumatic injuries, complex surgeries, um, and then also just uh, the post-operative care, treating patients to, to control infection and, and be able to, to insist on a, on a good outcome is, uh, is, a, is a real challenge for us. How secure is your facility uh, since the fighting is still ongoing? That's a good question. Uh, the Bashire Teaching Hospital is in Khartoum City, in South Khartoum. It's an area that we, uh, we selected. We had access to people, have access to, uh, to the hospital, but we're on, on the zone. I mean, we hear the bombs dropping even now. If the, if the speaker can pick it, gunshots and... Uh, smoke rising from from the city of Khartoum where the active fighting is. So we needed to be in a hospital that is close enough to the front line, close enough to the conflict to have an impact, to save those lives in that, in that time uh, it takes for people to get to us. But we also need to be uh, in a place that uh, keeps our staff safe and that patients are comfortable to, to be here. So we're really trying to find that, that zone in between, and, and this, is, this is where we've set up operations for now. I understand you're working with the local doctors as well. Are these government employees? What type of doctors are you, are you working with? Yeah, it's a real mix of, uh, of people that are supporting this, uh, this hospital. So Doctors Without Borders are working with uh, volunteers from the community, from the local area, as well as uh, doctors, nurses, medical staff who have volunteered their time, Sudanese health healthcare workers that uh, are also committed to, this, uh, to making this hospital functioning. So this hospital was completely non-functional volunteer initiative started it and then we've come in to really bring that that extra surgical capacity bringing in international staff supplies and a bit of uh, extra on top to to really make this into a, a functioning surgical referral center so we have a long way to go but the hospital is open 24 7 we're seeing patients coming in from quite far away even other areas of the city as the word spreads that doctors without borders is here to provide free health care to anyone um who, who can access this hospital. And I think that's, that's really a, a piece of this that we're, we're trying to, beyond the medical care, it's that humanitarian imperative and uh, to create a space that's neutral, impartial, 
insisting on our humanitarian principles and and providing quality free health care in, in a war zone. That's that's what this whole project is about. Given the enormous of the work you're doing there and uh, the people who are in dire stress, how do you get your supplies? Do you have enough supplies to cope with the task at hand? The supply question is a big one. And uh, the short answer is is not yet. We uh, are bringing in supplies, supplies that we had into the in the country. Uh, MSF Belgium, we had a warehouse about uh, 10 or 15 minutes away that we were able to access and pull some supplies from. We've gotten uh, supply from some of the other MSF sections, the, the Doctors Without Borders sections, MOH supply. And we just landed uh, yesterday uh, a cargo plane with almost 30 tons of medical supply into Port Sudan that's on the road traveling towards Khartoum as we speak. So the supplies are, are coming in. We need more support with that. We've we as Doctors Without Borders have lost supply as well due to looting and theft. Uh, some of the warehouses have been uh, broken into. So all of those impacts of, of, of the conflict are, are impacting our ability to, to provide health care. Fuel is another question. The uh, electric power grid is, is inconsistent at best. And of course, we can't have a power outage during, during an operation. So procuring diesel fuel and, um, and clean water just to keep this hospital running adds to the challenges beyond the, uh, beyond the medical work. That was Will Harper, MSF Emergency Coordinator in Khartoum. He spoke with VOA's Douglas Mpuga from Khartoum. Also, the United Nations says more than half of Sudan's population now needs aid and protection. Civilians are seeking shelter from airstrikes and sporadic clashes that continue between rival military factions in the Khartoum area. Residents say power has been cut, food is in short supply, drinking water is scarce due to the violent power struggle now in its second month despite international mediation efforts. Ambassador Johnny Carson was the U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs under the Obama administration and currently is the senior advisor at the Albright Stone Bridge Group at the United States Institute of Peace. He tells me no one expected what's currently happening in Sudan. Situation in Sudan is tragic and horrible uh, for all the people of that uh, country, but especially the people in the capital city of Khartoum. I think no one expected the kind of conflict that has emerged over the last three and a half weeks that has left that city partially destroyed and hundreds of thousands of people homeless and on the move. Uh, There is an immediate need for humanitarian assistance to get into Khartoum and into Sudan as fast as possible. Everyone who has an opportunity as a nation or government to help uh, address the humanitarian situation should do so. I know there are ongoing efforts to try to broker another ceasefire, but it is imperative that pressure be put uh, on all of the parties to uh, engage in a cessation of hostility to allow humanitarian aid and assistance to get into that country. Uh, The movement of peoples not only undermines the stability uh, inside of uh, Sudan, but it has a huge impact on all of the neighboring countries that are receiving refugees uh, from that tragic situation. U.S. uh, Secretary of State Antony Blinken said uh, last Monday uh, regarding uh, American citizens in Sudan, uh, since uh, you were like the former U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, American citizens in Sudan have told the U.S. government that they want to leave, but the State Department is providing them with advice and guidance, but there are still no plans to offer them transportation because it is too dangerous, according to Mr. Blinken. And there is an estimated 16,000 Americans in Sudan, many of them dual nationals. So what is the policy of the United States in situations like this? The United States uh, tends to do as best it can to stay in contact with American citizens. 
counselor sections routinely sent out messages to citizens uh, in a country. The counselor section is closed, but I think neighboring uh, countries and the U.S. government are, in fact, uh, trying to maintain contact with U.S. citizens who are currently in Sudan. There were several efforts, as I understand it, by the U.S. government to arrange for those Sudanese citizens, Sudanese American citizens who wanted to leave the country to do so. But the situation on the ground is dangerous, but I think the U.S. government is continuing to try to maintain email contact with those uh, individuals, giving them uh, information as best it can on how they might be able to leave the the country. Warnings uh, were issued, I think, uh, very clearly over the last uh, several weeks, encouraging uh, American citizens, dual nationals, to leave the country. And there were several convoys that were arranged by the State Department for individuals to, to leave the country. The situation is dangerous, but uh, it is the responsibility of uh, those citizens to uh, take care of themselves, to look out uh, after themselves. But it is a dangerous situation. I think there's still an ongoing effort to uh, try to provide those individuals with information on how they might be able to leave the country. That's former U.S. Assistant Secretary of State uh, for African Affairs, Johnny Carson. He talked uh, with me from Washington. The International Monetary Fund's Executive Board has approved a $3 billion bailout to help Ghana fight soaring inflation, high debt, and weakening currency. The IMF said yesterday the country will get $600 million immediately with the rest to be released over the next three years. The funds should help Ghana emerge from a financial crisis exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. However, the IMF will require changes in the country's tax system and public spending. Treading Economics, which provides global economic information, says inflation in Ghana topped 41% in April, falling for a, for a more than 20-year high, just over 54% in December, but still well above the central bank's target of 6% to 10%. IMF Managing Director Kristalina Georgieva said the Bank of Ghana The country's central bank will keep raising interest rates to combat inflation, stop financing the government's budget, and allow a flexible exchange rate, among other steps. The leaders of the Group of Seven Nations arrived in Hiroshima, Japan, today for their annual summit. Among other issues, they will weigh tighter sanctions on Russia and protections against what some consider China's economic coercion as well as its human rights record. Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida is hosting leaders from six of the wealthy democracies in his hometown, a city synonymous with unclear destruction and home to several peace monuments. Leaders, including U.S. President Joe Biden, will try over three days to forge a united front on Russia and China, where the Allies' interests do not always neatly align. Jennifer King with the Associated Press has more. President Biden greeted troops and Japanese officials at a hangar at a Marine Corps air base near Hiroshima before heading to a meeting with Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida. The bottom line, Mr. Prime Minister, is that uh, when our countries stand together, we stand stronger. White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan says the two leaders have a lot to talk about ahead of the larger Group of Seven summit. The military dimension of the alliance, the economic dimension, the recently concluded agreement on clean energy, the work we're doing together on economic security. Uh, This alliance, I think, is in a genuine high watermark. The president's cutting his trip short in hopes of finalizing a deal to raise the government's debt limit. White House staff who've been negotiating with Congress will be along for the trip and be part of the team updating the president on the status of the talks. I'm Jennifer King. The full summit kicks off tomorrow and concludes on Sunday. Immediately afterwards, President Biden heads back to Washington, D.C., canceling his plans to visit Papua New Guinea and Australia. Instead, he will focus on the debt limit talks with members of the U.S. Congress. 
Egypt's national dialogue has began three days a week. This week's discussion focused on the electoral system of the House of Representatives, economic issues and some human rights issues. Some government critics say the tightly controlled national dialogue may leave room for minor economic reforms, but it is unlikely to generate the serious political changes that people are increasingly demanding. Mohammed Anwar Sadat, president of the Egyptian Liberal Party for Reform and Development, talks with VOA senior analyst Mohammed El Shenawi about whether President Abdel Fattah El Sisi needed this national dialogue to fix the political and economic problems. Well, honestly, he doesn't need. If there is a will, I think he can do it. But fine, let's see if he would like to make a big shift in his policies, and he would like to have it as an outcome of a national dialogue, fine. For me, the most important is that it happened, Uh, whether it comes from him personally or it comes out of this uh, dialogue, fine. I don't care. The most important is we would like to live in peace and stable and opportunities for everyone. This is what I would like to see happening. The recommendations of the National Dialogue Committees in Egypt will be submitted to the president himself, who will then decide what to accept or what to reject. Only afterward will they be debated in the parliament with expected approvals. You were a veteran member of the Egyptian parliament. Does the existence of such a process illustrate more than anything the total powerlessness of the Egyptian parliament? Well, as we all know, following the performance of the parliament, of course, they don't have full authority to deal with many things. We haven't seen any kind of a real questioning or accountability to the government or confidence vote. We haven't seen this. But the way I see it is that there is some independent voices in the parliament whom I think they can speak the truth and whom They are willing to support all what we believe should happen in this country. So I believe if President Sisi will consider whatever the recommendation come out of this dialogue or the advisory board, I think if it's passed to the government for executive orders or to the parliament for amending legislations or having a new legislations, I think the parliament will consider and they will act and it will be uh, somehow having a big chance to be adopted. Uh, This is my impression. I think the president, the government, they have come to an understanding that time has come, that there has to be a change in the policies. Somehow they should show some flexibility and they should give up this exceptional measures they used to have during the last couple of years because there is no justification for any exceptional measures. The country is more or less stable, peaceful. Uh, there is no threats, uh, terrors. So if we are facing such a severe economic and financial problem, the only way is to bring people together so they can be more productive, they can be more united. This is the only way out. And I hope that this is already in the mind of the president and all the government. That was Mohammed Anwar Sadat, president of the Egyptian Liberal Party for Reform and Development, speaking with VOA's Mohammed El Shinawi. And with that, we wrap up this edition of African News Tonight. I'm Yehiyas Wuhib in Washington.